you, son. Cheddar Leomar. No, it's not a cheese. It's a king. We get to get to him today. So let's check this out. It's always exciting to learn about Cheddar Leomar and his posse. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariot, king of Elisar, Chedileamar, king of Alam, and Tidal, king of nations, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Beersha of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, she Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. I know this is all review for you guys. Most of these names we have memorized since childhood. All these joined together in the Valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. In 12 years, they served Chedileamar. In the 13th year, they rebelled. In the 14th year, Chedileamar and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim in Ashtoreth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shaba Kiriathaim. Now, whew. Oh, let's go to six. And the Horites in their mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Is this captivating yet? Really, this stuff is uh, actually kind of cool because you got to piece the puzzle together. You know, that's one thing about the Bible is the better you know it, the more exciting things get. Because there's really cool stuff. But if you don't know the connections, if you don't know how to piece together the puzzle, then it's just like you're talking about some guy from some place and some things and some stuff. And Let's start with the simple stuff. There's the five kings of Sodom that rebel against Chedileamar and his rule. Now, five kings for five cities. Many of us are familiar with Sodom and Gomorrah, but there was also Adma and Zeboim that were attacked during that time. And there's also Bela that gets named Zoar, which was the small city in the middle that is going to be... Um, They didn't attack it. God doesn't destroy it. It's delivered. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. So, um, so actually, when people talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, there's actually Adma and Zeboim. And I think, what book were we in? Were we in, uh, might have been Nahum. Might have been Nahum. It was one of the minor prophets we recently studied at our church where uh, God is lamenting and, and doesn't want them to become like Adma and Zeboim. And it's like, what is that all about? Well, if you don't know that those were part of the cities that were destroyed in the plain of Sodom, and it doesn't mention them in the chapter of Sodom and Gomorrah, but they're mentioned here and elsewhere as being part of those five cities. So there's just some interesting facts for you. So then this is where you put all together. Ah, when I read this chapter, it lets me know the names of additional cities that were destroyed in the Sodom and Gomorrah chapter. So then when I'm reading my minor prophets, and God says he doesn't desire for them to become like uh, Adma and Zeboim. I know that those are two of the cities that were destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah, and God's desire was that Jerusalem would not be destroyed, like Adma and Zeboim. So, but this Chetelamar guy, let's get back to this. So he goes and he attacks. Now, it's funny, the word attacks uh, there in the, in the LXX, the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, uh, they use a word that means to chop into pieces, okay? The Rephaim. Now, Rephaim, the Rapha, all right? It's literally uh, a word that's used and known as giants. In fact, let me go back and actually correct there. The Septuagint, chop into pieces, it literally says to chop into pieces the gigantes, the giants, they attack the Rephaim, this giant race. In fact, 17 times that word Rephaim is translated as giant in our Bible. Then we have this group called the Zamz or the Zuzim. 
Later in Deuteronomy 2, we're going to hear a reference to the Zazuzim, which is probably the same descendants of the same group of people. The name means powerful ones. The Zuzim are the powerful ones. The Emim can be translated terrible ones. Now, if we look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, so I'm going to flip up to Deuteronomy because this is our commentary. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Verse 10, the Eman had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. They were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Emim. So there we have the Emim being mentioned. And where is it? Oh, verse 20 of Deuteronomy 2. That was also regarded as the land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there, but the Amorites called them Zamzumim. So the Moabites called them Emim. The Amorites called them the Zanzumim. Here they're just called the Zumim. Who are these people? Well, they're like for the descendants of Anak. Now in uh, the book of Deuteronomy and we go into Joshua, we're told that the Anakim lived in the land, the land of the, pro the promised land that they were supposed to possess. And they refer to them again as Nephilim. And this is our word back from Genesis chapter six. And I mentioned Nephilim and YouTube starts blowing up and people start freaking out and talking about stuff. Listen, we go back to Genesis chapter six and it says in verse four that Nephilim were on the earth in those days. The Jews, the scholars who 300 years, two to 300 years, second to third century BC before Christ, right? When they translated this into Greek, they chose to use the word gigantes, that giants were on the earth in those days. And in Genesis 6, it says, and also afterwards. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, what does that mean? Again, Sons of God, B'nai Elohim, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, it only ever speaks of angels. A fallen angel, we call a demon. I've had people try and explain it away differently to me, and it never makes sense to me. Um, in the New Testament, we see the term sons of God, but once again, it's a different language. You can be a child of God, right? I mean, you could, obviously that phrase could mean more than things, but the catch is that in our Old Testament, in the Hebrew, that phrase, B'nai Elohim, it's only used a few times and it only ever speaks of angels. Just because we see the phrase, son of God, for instance, someone brought up the genealogy in Luke, that, oh, well, the word son of God is used there. Right, but again, it's a different language written in a different thing, so... My whole point is that Genesis 6 says that there were giants afterwards. These are some of those giants afterwards. But Chedileamar and his big posse comes and wipes much of them out. Not all of them out. Because we're going to find in Deuteronomy chapter 2 why these giants are getting brought up is because, hey Craig, <laughs> is because um, Agabashan. This guy has a bed that's like 13 feet long. And we assume it's because he was 11 to 12 feet tall. And we're going to read about how they got rid of all the giants, except for, and this is in Deuteronomy and Joshua, in some of the areas of Gaza and the Philistine territories. Well, who will later come out of Gaza but Goliath of Gath, well, Gath, Gaza, the Philistine territories, and his brothers, his four giant brothers. And so it's fascinating stuff, fascinating stuff. Does this have to do much with um, the gospel? No. Salvation? No. Confusing people? Oh, yeah. Talking about giants just makes people freaked out. But, you know, we believe in a God who parted waters. We believe 
in spiritual things. Moses turns his rod into a snake. And then Pharaoh has his magicians turn their rods into snakes. It's just stuff that we need to remember that quite often people become repelled from the supernatural. And, you know, if we just read the Bible like it is and just accept it, it's probably the best way to interpret the Bible. And this also applies to when we're looking at other verses. For instance, as the day and age in which we live is always changing, what is acceptable, what is okay to talk about changes. And so people, again, try and change the Bible to what is more acceptable and easier to swallow. I was listening to Alistair Begg yesterday as he was recently at the uh, East Coast Calvary Chapel Pastors Conference. And he talked about how the day is coming in America, and it's probably going to be something I'll be talking about sometime soon, maybe in two weeks as we hit Daniel chapter uh, 6. But the time is coming where just plainly teaching the Bible and just taking it at face value is what it means. It might end some pastors up in jail, and that's okay. We'll do what we have to do. But when you read Romans 1, and you get to that latter part, and it speaks about men leaving the natural use of the woman and women leaving men and to burn and lust for each other for what is shameful. It's like, yeah, the Bible speaks pretty clearly that homosexuality, bestiality, premarital sex, these are all things that the Bible says is wrong because it's not what God designed us for, one man and one woman for life. But people will argue and say, well, the Bible doesn't really say that. And again, it's like, yeah, you know, if you just be honest and try and do an honest bit of studying, the Bible does say that. You know, if you're just honest, <laughs> the Bible does say there were giants in the days before the flood and also afterwards. And it seems like they pretty much got wiped out. It was a small race. How did the giants survive the flood is always the big question. And once again, I give you two possible options just for the people who are interested in that. One option. Noah was perfect in his generations. That is a fact. In fact, I think because of the fact of the DNA of descendants of giants being a concern, it's why Noah was <coughs> It's why Noah was picked because he was perfect in his genealogy is what it says. He had a perfect genealogy. And I'm going to go on a limb and just say his wife was too. That would mean his three sons were but we don't know about the wives. And if Ham's wife was one quarter Nephilim, one eighth Nephilim, the gene could have passed on. The giants probably wouldn't have been as big or as powerful as scary, but the gene would have passed on. And um, it's interesting that the descendants of Ham are Canaan, and almost all the giants we read about are all Canaanite and from that area. And so it almost makes it sense like the gene passed to this one group of people. And that's why we don't read about them all over the world. We read really just in one area. Do we read about them all over the world? Hey, you know what? Go look up Native American traditions and other traditions. And there actually are traditions of people, uh, of giant, powerful, strong, superhuman beings all over time. The Greeks wrote about them, right? Have you ever heard the story where one of the gods, one of the angelic beings comes down and procreates with a human. And then we have people like Hercules. Where do these stories come from? Native Americans have their own traditions that are really similar. Why is it that Native Americans and Greeks have similar trans, uh, traditions, but they're on the opposite sides of the world? Maybe because there's a shred of truth. A shred. I'm not reading Greek mythology to know the truth of you know, the world and the Bible, but is there a shred of truth in there? Yeah, maybe. Makes sense. There's like hundreds of ancient flood traditions throughout the world. Wonder why? Maybe because at one point they all gathered together at a tower, had their languages confused, traveled around, and these stories that they were all familiar with got passed down into legends and traditions in different tribes and tongues. And of course, just like playing telephone, waiting in line for the lunchroom in elementary school, the message gets a little bit distorted along the way. But Option two, I didn't give you option two. Option two is that 
it happened again, that, that fallen angels uh, procreated with man yet again. Um, some people prefer that one. Some people prefer the passing down through the genetic line like Ham's wife. I'm going to lean to the Ham's wife side. It, it seems to be that those angels who did commit such sin, and you need to look at uh, the book of Peter and of Jude, they both speak of the angels who left their, pro their, their uh, proper abode and came and they were being punished specifically. Um, they were cast into the abyss. Legion begs Jesus not to cast them into the abyss. Cast me into the swine, cast me anywhere, just not the abyss. It seems as if that is the place, also known as Tartarus in the Greek, which is where the Titans in Greek mythology were condemned to. Tartarus is supposed to be below hell. They say as far as hell is below heaven is how far Tartarus is below hell. These are the old ancient traditions. And so um, perhaps this punishment was so severe it would scare away any angels or demons from doing such a future thing. I've gone kind of long today. I'm sorry. Anyway, if you ever want to talk about this kind of stuff, there's lots of cool things. In fact, what is the, the giant cities of Bashan? I've got this hundred some year old book. Very cool. It's got the old pages. You gotta be careful with the really cool artwork with the little thin kind of waxy page covering all the beautiful pictures. But this was actually really cool. This was a uh, an English explorer who was funded by some Christian Lord in England, right? Sends them to the promised land. Now this was in the 1800s. And so it's funny to read the recounts because he goes like to Capernaum and it's like, well, we know Capernaum was around here, but we don't know exactly where. It's like, I've been to Capernaum. Everything's dug up. All the cities are there. But a long time ago, a lot of stuff that was there has been destroyed in the last 150 or so years. And this guy talks about going into the area of Bashan. Bashan is the area east of the Jordan right? Kind of Manasseh territory where Manasseh, the East Manasseh took over. And, and uh, Rick, the bulls of Bashan, we read about Bashan and then Og of Bashan. So it was an area. Um, and he talks about finding these stone houses with doors that are 12 feet tall on iron, stone doors, stone doors on iron hinges. And this guy said in the 1800s, he could still push it open with one hand and this door 12 feet tall, four feet wide would swing open. And if you know anything about the Middle East and ancient homes, quite often doors were small and you would dip your head to go on inside. Yet there, there's all these big buildings with these big doors and big stuff. Back then it was still around. But they talk about that a lot of the Bedouin and the people who were in there started destroying stuff when they started seeing Westerners with their interest in it. So fascinating stuff. I could go on and on. It's kind of a hobby of mine, but if you've got questions about Nephilim, let me know sometime. We can chat about it. I don't want to dwell on the weird stuff. Tomorrow, we're going to get back to normal, wholesome Christianity with no giants or fallen angels or any of that scary stuff. All right? But, <clears throat> <clears throat> but let me reemphasize maybe the best application point one more time. We must train ourselves to read the Bible, to learn to interpret the Bible in the most logical, literal, historical, grammatical method we can, where we, we understand there is poetry, but unless it demands to be poetry, we take it literally. And no matter how big the pill is, we learn to swallow it. Even when it's weird, even when it challenges my beliefs, my temptations, my addictions, even when it challenges the personality, well, I was just born that way. Well, maybe God wants to deliver you. <laughs> and so learning to do that is important. And that's something we can glean from all this. So there you go. God bless you guys. Have an amazing day. And I will see you guys manana.